Hey y'all, it's uh, Stephen Van Kappen Lewis on November 13th, and um, you know, <clears throat> it's fall, so I have brought all of my plants inside, and I am happy to report they all fit in the greenhouse, um, but just barely, so I'm really glad that I didn't go crazy at Tam Miami and buy a whole bunch of new orchids. Uh, because it gives me a little wiggle room, um, some of these plants will also come inside soon. Um, not because they really need to, but because I'm going to have a, a grow tent going, and I'm going to get that started and having sort of its own series or, or series of updates, I guess, probably starting towards the end of the month. Uh, I'm talking to my friend Drew over at Carnivero, who is Carnivero is a, a carnivorous plant company that's just down the road from me and he I'm gonna get some some lights from him for the grow tent and then once I get everything set up I'll, I'll start doing regular videos on that and you know that, that that's really for my more sensitive orchids like I have three seedling doyanas Cattleya doyana um, that you know they did fine last year in the greenhouse so they would see temperatures close to freezing every now and then uh, by accident and I don't want to repeat that so plants like that will be inside and we'll talk more about them um, like I said about the end of November no just sort of a, a greenhouse tour of my little itty bitty greenhouse and talk about some of the details and why I put some of the plants where they are what I use to heat um, what I use to circulate the air and other things like that. So uh, let's get the, the camera turned around and get looking at some plants. So from the outside looking in, uh, this is the greenhouse. As you can see, it is nothing fancy. My finger is paint, pointing north, so it's uh, easy direction to remember. So we are on the south side looking north. Uh, sun rises over there. Sun sets over there. So but before we really get into the plants, there's a monarch butterfly going past. Um, I really want to talk about this is a fan, just a plain old fan from, from the store. And then this is a small electric heater that is really used as supplemental heat for the really cold days. But the fan I found is absolutely critical for moving the air around. Uh, without having that fan just moving the hot air, the hot air actually at night will stack up on the top. It's almost as though heat rises, who knew? Um, but the, the air will stack up at the top of the greenhouse and then just sort of dissipate into, into the night without actually warming the plants. And the temperature differential can be pretty substantial from the bottom of the greenhouse, which of course is where the, the plants are, to the top where the warm air stacks up. But as you can see, I've got this sort of um, double pane um, polycarbonate here on the sides, uh, on sort of the end caps, and then the top is just single, single ply carbonate, I guess you can say. <clears throat> Nothing special. I got this whole setup for free. Someone was breaking down their greenhouse, and their house was going to be flattened because it was in a flood zone. And they said, hey, do you do you want a free greenhouse? They said, heck yeah. So uh, I had a, a, a slab poured, a concrete slab, as you can see there. So everything is nailed down. I have, uh, I do have some electricity out here. It's only one cord, so I can't really run heat out of there, but I can. It is enough electricity that will make it out here to uh, power that automatic fan to come on when the world is too hot in here, which is just about every day and then um, the, the fan at night which circulates the air uh, over there is a southern burner heater with a, a piece of wood on top obviously as you can imagine that wood is not there when the heat is on but that's the piece of wood that blocks the night light from my neighbor's house from coming into my walkerianas and we'll take a look at those here in a moment those buds that I showed last week are, are really enlarging and getting bigger um, if we back up a bit, this is where my seedlings are. And so basically what I want to do is have 
the smallest statured plants on the south side and then as we go north into the greenhouse more that's where the taller statured plants are and everything over here it's it's mostly cattleyas over here and then I have my certipodiums here and my um, catacetum types back here on the ground as you can see they're still mostly leafed out but there are some buds and stuff to see uh, so we'll we'll go through this quickly no reason to spend a whole lot of time just want to talk a little bit about my setup oh and of course the illuminate can't forget the illuminate you can kind of see it there up here and then you can see this dark spot over here that's the shade of the oak trees starting to to block the late afternoon sun I will pull the illuminate off here in a couple days actually so basically from November 15 to March 15 I don't need any shade cloth on top of my greenhouse at all uh, these panels are old and kind of crappy and um, they are old enough to block enough sun that uh, I don't need the, the, the shade cloth. However, on March 15, and I've said this before in other videos, on March 15, I have to get that shade cloth back up. Otherwise, on March 16, and this has happened several years now, March 16, my, my plants will start to burn. So that November 15 to March 15 window of shade-free greenhouse growing uh, is a pretty hard set date and I really have to abide by it if I want good plants. But enough talk about that. Oh, as you can see, a gravel floor. Uh, I meant to hit the ground with Roundup before I got my plants back in, but I had cold weather creep up on me a little faster than I wanted to, so I've, I've hand pulled some of the weeds, and, um, but as you can see, there's still some left. So, Cattleyas. Not a whole lot going on, lots of green leaves. And as I, as I mentioned, you can see that these are, are increasing in size so that ideally um, no one's really blocking anyone else for, for strong sun. So tall plants in the, pa in the back, a lot of those will actually start blooming in here in the greenhouse before it's warm enough to kick them out for the season, which is usually early to mid-April. And then the short ones down here. see I've got the Cattleya amethysta glossa and these Ancelia um, sort of towering above everyone else. Uh, this is my purpurata. Chop this one up. This is what your purpurata bulbs should look like if all is well. If you're watering enough and fertilizing enough and you can see that this one is still in active growth. In fact most of these plants will grow throughout the winter. Nonetheless, I still don't really fertilize in the winter. I guess I could. Maybe I should, but I don't. <laughs> um, Barcaria wartoniana. I got this as a division from Miller's Tropicals. And I've got two big tall spikes growing, so this will be cool. Hopefully it doesn't get much taller than that. Otherwise, they'll both be taller than the greenhouse, and I'll have to move this plant somewhere else. Some extra plants. There's enough light here for these cattleyas. These guys are tall. This is a division of that amethyst glossa. Um, I'm letting it root so that I can sell it in the spring, probably. Probably to someone local. This is too big to ship. But the Walkerianas. Oh, before I get to that, this is just a cheap little um, thermostat. This is connected to the southern burner heater. Here's the beast that I got actually from Drew a couple years ago. Runs on propane. This gets the carbon monoxide out so nobody dies, including myself. Here are the Wakarianas. You know, this one was in full bud last week and I made a video about that and it continues to look good. I think I'm going to have a really nice show from this plant finally after many years of growing it. And going by the different stages of, of flowering from these sort of advanced buds over here to these smaller buds here, 
to these very young um, spikes right here. I'm gonna have flowers on this for months, so I'm pretty excited. I've got another really big fat spike. I don't know if the camera is zooming in on this, but the tip of my finger, probably not zooming in on my hand. I've got a really fat spike there, and you can see it almost as these emerge, it almost looks like the 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 spike vomits flowers out, and I think there's gonna be a lot of vomit in that particular spike, so I'm excited. Um, more Wakarianas. Here's a, a, one of those, another spike that is coming along nicely for our first bloom. I've got some of Drew's Nepenthes down here. Of course, this channel is about orchids, so I'm not going to focus on those guys. Giant Peristeria, a lot of bulb. This side got sunburnt, but it's really cool. You can see Peristeria is. A myrmecophile, so they have chambers where the ants can grow. I don't think I can zoom. There we go. If you look past the ugliness, you can see the chambers at the bottom of the bulb where the um, the ants can live, which is kind of cool. Uh, also of note, try not to let your plants get that badly sunburned in the Texas sun or any sun at all. <laughs> Pro tip. All right, here are the catacetums. I'll go through this fairly quickly. Lots of leaves. How many people out there have catacetums with lots and lots of leaves as well? As you can see, I mean, I pulled some leaves off before this video, but man, these guys are still going strong um, despite my best efforts. But basically, I'm probably gonna stop watering pretty soon maybe maybe i'll water these guys in a week or two from now remember I, I grow in the pet method so there's a water well at the bottom of every single one of these um plants so if i do water that water sits in there for a while so i, I don't really need to water very much at all this time of year I, I do want them to dry completely before between waterings um that's just so that they know that it's winter time and they should start going to sleep there are some blooms over here. Got some female flowers here on this catacetum. As you can see, they're green hoods. Nothing special to look at, but the scent is really strong. Such a, a cool flavor. Uh, that Sicknikes Coopery. I made a video about probably close to a month ago, I think. Um, the flowers are just fading with this last one right here, still still growing strong. Uh, looks, this last flower actually looks pretty good and, ah, it smells wonderful. I do have Cloacetum down here. Let me get the leaf out of the way, my apologies. Um, that smells very strongly of a sort of cinnamon or anise flavor, almost like a licorice. Catacetum Fong Sing, of course, the gift from William Green that was awarded on female flowers is putting out some more flowers. So this one is um, looking good. This is. Big, fat, strong spike. You can see those, I don't know if you can see, plenty of ants. I love the ants, I think they're cool. Uh, if you don't like ants, that's okay, but just know that they're probably not gonna harm your plants. I don't really see any reason to, uh, to treat for ants since they don't, they don't do anything negative to my plants. And finally, my certipodiums over there, as you can see, are still going strong. Let me walk over. They should be dropping their leaves soon. They, they've already had a few leaves come off. And you can see some, some really nice aerial roots on the epiphytes back there. And some of these older leaves are starting to drop. So they are starting to realize it's winter. And the last thing I'll show you is this 
Neobenthamia gracilis. Well, actually, that's the old name. This is now Polystachia neobenthamia. Um, another strongly fragrant species. I hope this is showing up in my camera. I can't really see. Um, as you can tell, I grow things that are strongly fragrant, and I really, really go out of my way to avoid things that are not fragrant. This one was pollinated by something, so I will rip these off so the plant doesn't spend a bunch of energy on babies that I don't want. Anyway, that's the greenhouse. Hope you guys are having a great weekend, and I will talk to you later. See ya.